Hello, everybody, and welcome back to assignment number four for A Raisin in the Sun. Um, yesterday, we had read the first part of assignment number four, and something very important happened. It was read at the end of Act One. Um, Walter came home, um, and the first thing he does is he demands, did it come, did it come? And of course, he's talking about the check, because remember, that's all that he's thinking about right now. He believes that is his ticket to his dream, which, you know, again, he has every right to have these dreams. He should have these dreams. It's a good thing to have dreams like that. But unfortunately, he has, everything else is kind of closed off to him right now because he's so, I don't know what the word is, just so upset about the fact that he's never had a chance to have his dreams, rightfully so, but he's closing himself off to everything else that's going on around him. And that specifically is about his family. He just found out from his mother that his wife is pregnant with another child of his and even worse than that that the mother believed that she may be going mama believed that ruth might be going to an abortion doctor um and ruth actually came out and admitted that yes not only has she already seen the abortion doctor but she has put a down payment down for five dollars which shows that she is wants to go through with it um walter's reaction was not what mama expected or demanded, which was, no, you're not going to destroy our child. You're not going to get an abortion. We're going to stick together. We're going to be a family. We're going to raise and love this child. Um, he didn't say anything. He grabbed his coat and he left. Ruth tried to go with him and he wouldn't let her come with him. He wants to go off and be by himself. Um, when we left off, mama had actually said, um, if you a son of mine, tell her. And Walter picks up his keys and his coat and he walks out. She continues bitterly. You you're a disgrace to your father's memory. Somebody get me my hat. Um, remember, when it comes to his father, Walter Sr., um, that was the most important thing to him, was the family, was his children. That's what mama, she went through and she told us. And that when Claude, their baby, died, um, it destroyed Walter Sr. That was the beginning of the end for him. Um, and she wants to see Walter acting like that, like the father, because the father would never have allowed something like that to happen for a baby to be aborted or destroyed. So she wants Walter to step up and say, no, I'm not going to allow this to happen. But Walter didn't. Walter left. Um, because again, Walter is dealing with his dream and the fact that he now believes that mama is deferring his dream because mama is not giving him that money to open up the liquor store with his friends. So let's begin act two, scene one, and it is later that same day. So this has been such a big day, if you'll recall, they got the check today. Um, Walter, I'm sorry, Ruth went and saw an abortion doctor today. Um, Travis was outside playing with rats. Um, Asagai came over and you know, was very romantic with Benny, with Benita. And of course you had Walter's issue with the check and then finding out about the pregnancy and whatnot. So we, it's been a very crazy day for the youngers. And now it continues. It's later that same day at Rise. Ruth is ironing again. She has the radio going. Presently Benita's bedroom door opens and Ruth's mouth falls and she puts down the iron in fascination. What have we got on tonight? So Benny opens the door and Ruth opens her mouth, drops it open because she's wearing something that Ruth has never seen her wear. My guess is without even looking down that she has put on those Nigerian clothes, um, at the, the robes and whatnot. And I think there's even a little bit more. Don't forget, Asagai called um, uh, Benita an assimilationist, which really got under Benita's skin and pointed out that her hair is mutilated. Um, and that she doesn't wear it naturally and normally. Now, Benita, emerging grandly from the doorway so that we can see her thoroughly robed in the costume Asagai brought. You're looking at what a well-dressed Nigerian woman wears. She parades for Ruth, her hair completely hidden by the headdress. She is coquettishly fanning herself with an ornate oriental fan, mistakenly more like butterfly than any Nigerian that ever was. Isn't it beautiful? She promenades to the radio and with an arrogant flourish turns off the good lousy blues that is playing. Enough of this assimilationist junk. Ruth follows her with her eyes as she goes to the phonograph and puts on a record and then turns and waits ceremoniously for the music to come up. Then with a shout, Okom Sojie! Ruth jumps. The music comes up. A lovely Nigerian melody. Benita listens in rapture, her eyes far away, back to the past. She begins to dance. Ruth is dumbfounded. Okay, so remember, um, Asagai also gave Benita some Nigerian records. Um, now, Ruth, I'm sorry, Benita is playing those records right now. And I just want to point out, again, look 
how much Asagai affected Benita by calling her assimilationist. She just turned off the blues and the jazz music and said, enough of this assimilation is junk. In other words, she wants to be more African-American than American. And I also want to point out one thing. Her hair is covered completely by the headdress, part of the costume that she's wearing, the Nigerian robes. It also comes with a headdress. So why did Lorian Hansberry, the author of this play, let us know that her hair is hidden? That's because something interesting has happened with her hair, and I bet you we can all figure it out. Let's go. Ruth jumps. The music comes up. A lovely Nigerian melody. Benita listens in rapture, her eyes far away, back to the past. She begins to dance. Ruth is dumbfounded. Ruth, what kind of dance is that? Benita, a folk dance. Ruth, Pearl Bailey, what kind of folks do that, honey? Benita, it's from Nigeria. It's a dance of welcome. Who are you welcoming? The men back to the village. Ruth, well, where have they been? Benita, how should I know? Out hunting or something. Anyway, they're coming back now. Ruth, well, that's good. Benita, with the record, Alundi, 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 Alunya, Japu, Ajipua, Angu, Sua, Ayayia, Ayayia, Alundi. Walter comes in during this performance. He has obviously been drinking. So what was Walter's response to hearing the news of today? That he's not getting the money, that his wife is pregnant and possibly thinking about aborting his child, their child? He went and he got drunk. Not a very good way to deal with things. Um, and now he comes in and he walks into the house and this is what he sees. He sees his sister wearing these Nigerian clothes. She's got the headdress on. She's dancing around the room in what she thinks a Nigerian woman would dance. I mean, clearly she's not dancing correctly and she's probably not pronouncing, you know, pronouncing the African words correctly, the Nigerian speech correctly, just like I'm sure I just butchered it. And I'm sorry to anybody who knows Nigerian um, and can hear just how bad I butchered it. Um, and I apologize, of course, I tried my best. Um, but here's Walter and he's standing there and he's watching her doing this. I wonder how he's going to react. Now, normally up until this point, Walter has been very critical of his sister. I mean, he wakes up and he says things like, you horrible looking chick this early in the morning. Um, and he calls her, not only does he call her ugly, he says she shouldn't be a doctor, she should mind her own place, blah, blah, blah. So he's been very rough on her, very critical. Um, but now he comes in and he sees her with this headdress on and dancing and whatnot. How is he going to react? Let's see. He has obviously been drinking. He leans against the door heavily and watches his sister at first with distaste. So he does not like what she is doing or how she is doing it. But then watch. Then his eyes look off back to the past as he lifts both his fists to the roof screaming. Okay, so this is interesting. When they say his eyes look off back to the past, that's him now looking at what his sister looks like and how she's acting if she was in Nigeria. And now he, in his mind, is putting himself in Nigeria. And guess what he sees himself in Nigeria? He sees himself as a Nigerian warrior who has a future. Because in Nigeria, he is not held back by white people or by the government. They allow them to do what they want and to be who they want. Walter is going to fall into that dream because in that dream, he has a choice and a chance to be the best that he can be. Where in America, he cannot. He is held back. His dreams are deferred. So watch Walter slip into this dream in a good way. He wants this. Watch, Walter. Yeah, and Ethiopian stretched forth her hands again. Ruth, dryly looking at him. Yes, and Africa Shore is claiming her own tonight. Now, Ruth, Ruth doesn't see what Benita and Walter see. Benita is looking back into the past in her mind's eye and also pretending to be an African woman, a strong African woman who dances and sings and dresses the, the way she wants to and, and acts the way she wants to. It's not like the America that defers African-Americans, black people's dreams and holds them down. It's quite the opposite. So Walter and Benita are falling into this dream because they want to see what it feels like for a minute to live that type of life. Ruth, on the other hand, she's got her own problems over there with the baby coming and with Walter's problems and the apartment and the possible house. So Ruth Ruth isn't falling into this right now. Watch, Walter. She gives them both up and down. She gives them both up and starts ironing again. Walter, all in a drunken, dramatic shaft. Shut up. I'm digging them drums. 
Them drums move me. He makes his weaving way to his wife's face and leans him close to her. In my heart of hearts, he thumps his chest. I am much warrior. Ruth, without even looking up. In your heart of hearts, you're much drunkard. Walter, coming away from her and starting to wander around the room, shouting, me and Jomo, intently in his sister's face. She has stopped dancing to watch him in this unknown mood. She is, she's watching her brother because she's never seen him like this. And again, he's not mocking her. He is joining her. I bet you Benita, and I did as well, Benita expected him to start mocking her right away. What are you doing with those crazy clothes? What are you doing dancing around like that? You're acting like a fool. You're acting crazy. No, that is not what he said. Because because she's not acting like a fool, because she's not acting crazy. She's embracing her heritage, her roots, and there's nothing wrong with that. And Walter's doing it too. And this is the first time he has ever, and in a long time, that she has seen Walter happy, she has not seen Walter. Walter is not, at this moment, depressed and acting, you know, like everybody's against him. In this moment, actually, Walter is showing that he has some dreams, that, 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 that something means something to him. Listen, me and Jomo, Intently in a sister's face, she has stopped dancing to watch him in this unknown mood. That's my man Kenyatta, shouting and thumping his chest. Flaming spear, hot damn! He is suddenly in possession of an imaginary spear and is actively spearing enemies all over the room. So now he's walking around the room and he's he's holding a fake spear in his hand and he's spearing enemies over the room. He says, oh, come to GA. And what is Walter doing right now? He's being powerful. He is expressing himself in a way that he is not allowed to express himself in America. And listen, beneath it to encourage her. I mean, think about what would what would a white person do if they came in and saw him acting this way? I don't think they would see it the way Walter and Benita and I see it right now of this is this is somebody going back and and you know experiencing their culture, their roots in a good and healthy way. Benita to encourage Walter, thoroughly caught up with this side of him. So Benita is excited because she's never seen him like this, so excited about something, so into something. She says, oh, come to GA, flaming spear. Walter, the lion is waking. Oh, oh, nie. He pulls his shirt open and leaps up on the table and gestures with the spear. So now he's up on the table and he's slamming his chest and he's holding a spear. And again, he is not mocking his sister or himself. He is living what he believes is a true life that he could have had if he was born in another country that didn't defer his dreams the way it happens in America now, the way it's crushing him. Walter on the table, very far gone, his eyes pure glass sheets. So he is living this idea right now. He's, gone, he's far gone from his reality. He sees what we cannot, that he is a leader of his people, a great chief, a descendant of Chaka, and that the hour to march has come. Listen, my black brothers. I mean, listen to what that just says. He sees what we cannot, that he is a leader of his people. Walter wants more than what he has in this American life that he has been not given, but that he lives and, and the fact that his dreams are, are deferred and, and, and he is oppressed in this dream of his. If he was living in Nigeria, he believes he sees himself as a great chief, not just as a warrior, but as a leader of warriors. And in America, can he be a leader among men? Are they, do they give him that chance? The answer is no, they do not give him that chance. And Walter believes in his heart, and I think he is right, I think everybody has this, this ability to lead others, to step up and do it. And Walter wants to show that he has this. So in this dream that he's living right now, he is living this. And Benita is into it as well, because I think she now sees that his brother, her brother really is a powerful and strong figure. He has everything it takes to be that type of person, that type of leader. But in America, they don't let him be that way. And Benita's finally seeing that now. Listen, my black brothers, Benita. Oh, come to GA. Walter, do you hear the waters rushing against the shores of the coastlands? Benita, oh, come to GA. Walter, do you hear the screeching of the cocks in yonder hills beyond where the chiefs meet in council for the coming of the mighty war? Benita, oh, come to GA. And now the lighting shifts suddenly to suggest the world of Walter's imagination. And the mood shifts from pure comedy. It is the inner Walter speaking. The south side chauffeur has assumed an unexpected majesty. Look at this. For the first time in his life, he feels more than the little bit they've given him. He feels what he believes he and what he knows that he can really be majestic, a ruler, a leader, someone that people can look up to. Not a chauffeur that, that, that a white person treats like garbage all the time and not even like a human being. 
Walter, do you hear the beating of the wings of the bird flying low over the mountains and the low places of our land? Benita, Alconsa Gie. Walter, do you hear the singing of the women, singing the war songs of our fathers to the babies in the great houses, singing the sweet war songs? The doorbell rings. Oh, do you hear me, my black brothers? Benita, completely gone. We hear you, flaming spear. Ruth shuts off the phonograph and opens the door. George Murchison enters. Oh, man. See, now, if Asagai had come over right now, how would Asagai have reacted to them acting? And I don't think they're playing. They're acting like, like Nigerian, right? They're, they have the robes on, and they're running around. Walter's running around the room with, with, with a, an imaginary spear, and he's pretending to be a leader. I think Asagai would come in, and I think Asagai would embrace them for doing this. I think he would say, see, you do see what it's like, that there, there is a better world than America, right? That, that, that you can be more than what they let you be here in this oppressive country. But George Murchison is the person who walked in there. Remember who George Murchison is. He is that rich guy that De Benita has been dating. Now remember, Benita believes that he is very spoiled, that he is very selfish, that he is, is egotistical, and that he's a jerk, right? He's shallow is the word. She said he's very shallow. He doesn't have much to him. How is he the guy who has been given everything he wants, who has all his dreams given to him because he is rich, right? How is he going to see this right now? Is he going to see them and join them and, and, and jump in and say, yes, let's go back to our heritage, to our culture? Or is he going to see them and is he going to mock them because he believes he is superior to them? And think about this. How does he feel he is in comparison to Walter? Walter, a man who is just according to, you know, who's just, uh, I'm putting it in quotes because there's nothing wrong with being a chauffeur. It's actually a pretty good job. Um, I know a lot of people who do drive, you know, Uber, Ubers or, or bus drivers, whatever. It's a good job. Um, but I don't think Walter, I'm sorry, I don't think George sees it that way. Um, I think he thinks that there's, I don't know, let's wait and see. Let's see how George reacts before I tell you what I think. Walter. Oh, by the way, I don't think Walter and Benita even know that George is in their apartment right now, that he's watching them do this. And remember, George, Walter is on top of a table right now with a fake spear, and he's pretending to be this, this, this warrior, in fact, this leader of warriors. Watch, Walter telling us to prepare for the greatness of the time. Lights back to normal. He turns and sees George. Black brother! He extends his hand for the fraternal clasp. So he looks over and he sees George standing there. And he doesn't act shamed for what he's doing because he's not ashamed of what he's doing. He is jumped into this with his full heart because at least in this, he can dream, right? Nobody's holding him back in this dream. He extends his hand for the fraternal class. Hey, black brother, join me. And look how George reacts. Black brother, hell. Ruth, having had enough and embarrassed for the family. Benita, you got company. What's the matter with you? Walter Lee Younger, get down off that table and stop acting like a fool. Walter comes down off the table suddenly and makes a quick exit to the bathroom. Now, the idea that he makes a quick exit to the bathroom, some people have said that he's going in there to, you know, just to get away from George to clean himself up and whatnot, to, you know, pick himself up. Other people have said that he's going in there to throw up because he's so drunk. Um, I don't believe it's that. I think it's more of he's just trying to get away from George for a moment, but I don't know. We, I don't think we can ever know. Ruth, he's had a little to drink. I don't know what her excuse is. So Ruth is just apologized for them acting this way. And I don't believe there's anything to apologize for. They weren't mocking anybody. They were getting into it. They were enjoying their culture and their heritage, right? Um, but Ruth is embarrassed for it. And she just says, well, he's drunk. That's why he's acting that way. But I don't know what her problem is. And George to Benita, look, honey, we're going to the theater. We're not going to be in it. So go change, huh? And now he just straight up mocked Benita for wearing those beautiful clothes, the Nigerian clothes. Now, again, if Asagai came in, remember what Asagai said when she draped it around her? He said, you backed very well. You look very beautiful in it. George says the exact opposite. He says, we're not going to, the, I said, we're going to the theater. We're not going to be in it. So go change, huh? So he just told her, take those things off. You look dumb. You look like you're acting or something. This isn't real. Benita looks at him and slowly, ceremoniously lifts her hands and pulls off her headdress. Her hair is close cropped and unstraightened. George freezes mid-sentence and Ruth's eyes all but fan out of her head. Do you see what Benita did? I'm going to read it again. And she does this on purpose. I love Benita. 
She does this to show George. Hey, listen, you think my outfit doesn't fit the times or America. Take a look at my hair. And she does it. She slowly, ceremoniously lifts her hands and pulls off the headdress. Her hair is close cropped, which means she has cut all her long hair and it is unstraightened. It is not straightened the way that, you know, white America and, you know, society wants her to dress. No, she is wearing her hair now the way it's supposed to be worn naturally, right? The way that they would be worn in Nigeria or in Africa. And George sees this and George, look, freezes in mint sentence and Ruth's eyes all but fan out of her head. So Ruth didn't even know this happened. And George says, what in the name of? Now, not for nothing, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, you should know this. When a woman cuts her hair, specifically one that you are dating, even if you don't like it, you don't tell her it looks awful or says, what did you do to your head? No, 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 you go, oh, that's lovely. I love it. Of course you do, because this is somebody you're dating. You want her to feel good about herself. But George says, what in the name of? And Ruth, touching beneath his hair. Girl, you've done lost your natural mind. Look at your head. George, what have you done to your head? I mean, your hair. Nothing, except cut it off. Ruth, now that's the truth. It's what ain't been done to it. You expect this boy to go out with your head all nappy like that? And she says, it's not what you've done. It's what you didn't do. You didn't straighten it. You've got it all normal and kinky and, and curly. You expect your, this boy to go out with your, with your head all nappy like that? Benita looking at George. That's up to George. If he's ashamed of his heritage, oh God, you gotta love Benita. She says, if he doesn't wanna go out with me, then he doesn't have to go out with me. I'm not ashamed of my heritage. I'm not ashamed of being an African-American woman. And George says, oh, don't be so proud of yourself, Benny, just because you look eccentric. Um, Benita, how can something that's natural be eccentric? All right, first of all, I need to know what eccentric means. So I'm gonna look it up right now. You're gonna bear with me while I do it. I'm gonna type this into Google, eccentric definition. I mean, I know what it means, but I want to share it with you, ladies and gentlemen. To be eccentric means uh, unconventional and slightly strange, all right? Um, unconventional and slightly strange. So basically what that means is not, not the way people expect you to do. So you might say that, you know, if everybody wears jeans to school now, but somebody comes in wearing sweatpants, well, they're eccentric because they're not doing what everybody else is doing and what everybody else expects them to do. And he just said, well, and listen, let's go back to it. Um, she says, uh, oh, don't be so proud of yourself, Benny, just because you look eccentric. And he says, just because you're different doesn't mean you need to be proud of yourself. Um, and she says, well, how can something that's natural be eccentric? And that's a really good question because eccentric means not of the norm. And she's saying, but if this is my natural hair, then how can it be eccentric? And he says, that's what being eccentric means, being natural, get dressed. And I think we just learned a little bit about George. He does not like the idea of Benita going back and practicing her heritage or practicing being um, you know, an African-American woman than just being an American woman. I think he wants her to assimilate. I think he wants her to have straight hair and do what American women are supposed to do, right? And that is to, you know, in these days, men would think, you know, they're supposed to, you know, be a wife, take care of the family, not go to school, not have any crazy ideas or dreams, just, you know, Take care of your man. That's what I think he thinks she should be. Now, is that beneath it? No. Is that what any woman should be? Absolutely not. It's, it, it is pretty much true. Um, you know, let's let's just continue. But the idea that that Benita has to act any different um, or do or assimilate, that's not who Benita is. But that's apparently who George wants. And you gotta love Benita when she says, um, if he's ashamed of his heritage, then he doesn't have to go out with me. Okay, and, beneath, and he says, that's what being eccentric means, being natural, get dressed. So he doesn't like the fact that she's being, that she has natural hair. And he says, get dressed. In other words, take those clothes off, fix that hair if you're going out with me. And Benita says, I don't like that, George. Why must you and your brother make an argument out of everything people say? Because I hate assimilationist Negroes. Interesting. She just said she doesn't like people 
who do what America, what 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 white America or the government or society or the people want them to do, which is interesting because her brother is not an assimilationist, but she doesn't like the fact that he has these dreams. But again, I don't think it's because he has dreams. I just think it's because she doesn't want to do a liquor store because she knows her brother doesn't have much experience with business. And those guys, Bobo and Willie Harris have none. So she's afraid of that. But she definitely, I mean, what is she doing with George? It makes no sense. I think uh, as a guy really affected her with that assimilationist language by calling her that. And Ruth says, will somebody please tell me what assimila whoever means? And George says, oh, it's just a way of college girls way of calling people Uncle Toms. But that isn't what it means at all. Ruth, well, what does it mean? Benita cutting George off and staring at him as she replies to Ruth. It means someone who is willing to give up his own culture and submerge himself completely in the dominant and in this case, oppressive culture. <sighs> she just, listen, let's say it again. She says it means someone who is willing to give up his own culture and submerge himself completely in the dominant, in this case, oppressive culture. So Benita says it means somebody who is willing to give up all of their African heritage because the culture they're in doesn't want them to have it. And Benita is absolutely right. You can never get away from your culture and from your heritage. It's what makes you who you are. And it should, and, and it defines who and you and your family and everybody is, right? And she's saying, I'm not gonna let that go. I'm not gonna let America take away my culture and my heritage. But George here has no problem doing that. Now, how does George feel about this right now? He says, oh dear, dear, here we go. A lecture on the African past, on our great Western Afri West African heritage. In one second, we hear all about the great Ashanti empires, the great Songhai civilizations, and the great sculptures of Benin, and then some poetry in the Bantu. And the whole monologue will end with the word heritage, nastily. Let's face it, baby, your heritage is nothing but a bunch of raggedy ass spirituals and some grass huts. Oh, Snap. Did you hear what George just said? And by the way, it's not just her heritage. It's his heritage too. He's an African-American man. And she, and he just said, listen to what he said, how awful this is. He said, let's face it, baby. Your heritage is nothing but a bunch of raggedy ass spirituals and some grass huts. What he's saying is, We've got nothing to take out of our culture. There's nothing good about African culture. It's just people living in the dirt. It's just people living in huts. They do not live the right way. They don't have, you know, the same culture that we have in America here. George is insane. There are so many wonderful things that come out of the African heritage. And he says there is nothing, that it's all bad. Wow, George, not only has he assimilated and he does everything that the way he's, you know, he, that people want him, white America and society want him to act, but he is so assimilated that he even hates his own culture. And he says there's nothing in it. Listen, Benita, grass huts. I love Benita's response. Listen to this very quickly, everybody. Ruth crosses her and forcibly pushes her to the bedroom. Ruth doesn't want Benita defending herself anymore or defending their culture because she wants to see George and Benita get together because George is rich. Me, I'd ask George to get the heck out of this house right now. Bye-bye. But this is what Benita says as she's getting pushed into her bedroom. See there? You're standing there in your splendid ignorance talking about people who were the first to smelt iron on the face of the earth. That's actually true. Smelting iron means melting down the metal iron and then turning it into instruments, whether it's, you know, uh, instruments of like swords and knives or spoons and forks, anything. And think about that. The first people in the world that would, that did something like that came from Africa. Listen, Ruth is pushing her through the door. The Ashanti were performing, performing surgical operations when the English, Ruth pulls the door to with Benita on the other side and smiles graciously at George. Benita opens the door and shouts the end of the sentence defiantly at George. We're still tattooing themselves with blue dragons. That's an interesting point as well. She's saying the Ashanti, these the African people, Ashanti Africans were, were performing surgeries on people, meaning cutting them open and fixing problems inside their bodies when English people were still tattooing themselves with blue dragons. In other words, they thought if you put a blue dragon on your body that that would fix you, that that would heal you. I mean, <laughs> that's insane. But that's what people did back in the day when they didn't understand things yet. And she's saying the African civilizations evolved even earlier than the European civilizations. They were doing these things. They were, they were melting iron. They were performing surgery. So Benita is defending, rightfully defending her culture. Listen. 
She goes back inside. Ruth, have a seat, George. They both sit. Ruth folds her hands rather primly on her lap, determined to demonstrate the civilization of the family. Warm, ain't it? I mean, for September. Pause. Just like they always say about Chicago weather. It's too, if it's too hot or cold for you, just wait a minute and it'll change. She smiles happily at this cliche of cliches. Everybody says it's got to do with them bombs and things they keep setting off. Pause. Would you like a nice cold beer? George, no, thank you. I don't care for beer. He looks at his watch. I hope she hurries up. Okay, so two things. The way he says, I don't care for beer. I mean, some people don't like beer, but I wonder if I get the feeling now that he's that he's insinuating or implying that beer is for poor people and he doesn't drink beer because he's not poor. And then he looks at his watch and says, I hope she hurries up. Now, what's the what, what's going on here? Is Are they going to be late for where they're going or does he just want to get out of this house where people offer him beers and act like, you know, they, they go into, into – their minds and act like you know they're Nigerians back in the day, right? He he wants to get away from these people rather than join them. And again, I say it now: if Asagai were here, I think he would be loving what was just what just happened right now. I think he would embrace it warmly and wholeheartedly. So let's continue. Ruth, what time is the show? George, it's an eight thirty curtain. That's just Chicago, though. In New York, standard curtain time is eight forty. I mean, listen to George. In New York, standard curtain time is 8.40. And then look, he's rather proud of this knowledge. So again, he's showing off not just how much money he has, but what he could do with that money, that he gets to go to New York sometimes and go to Broadway plays. I ask you this, have Walter and uh, Benita or Ruth or, or Travis ever been to New York City? The answer is probably not because it costs a lot of money to travel like that and people don't travel if they don't have money right they're very poor they have to have all their money for the med school and the bills and i think george is saying that again not only to show just how much he knows but also to show just how much he has and they don't ruth properly appreciating it you get to new york a lot george offhand eh, a few times a year ruth oh that's nice i've never been to new york Walter enters. We feel he has relieved himself, but the edge of the reality is still with him. Okay, so I don't think he went and threw up in the bathroom. I think people are wrong about that, but he has relieved himself. So he went to the bathroom, right? But it says the edge of an unreality is still with him. So you can tell a bit by his face that he is still affected by what happened, the whole acting like he was um, a majestic warrior and his sister doing it as well. And then what, now he says to, yeah, he comes in and he's listening to this conversation and he says, New York ain't got nothing, Chicago ain't. Just a bunch of hustling people all squeezed up together being Eastern. Now, why does Walter knock New York? Because George just talked about how great it was and Walter doesn't like George. So he is going to go against what he says. And he said, and, and also I think, you know, he's angry because George is over here bragging about what he has. He turns his face into a screw of displeasure. George, oh, you've been Walter plenty of times. Ruth shocked at the lie. Walter Lee younger. Now, why does Walter lie to George about going there? Why? Because he wants to act and he, he needs this, that he's not less than George even, that he is able to live the same life George lives, that he, George has dreams and gets to live them and so does Walter. Is it true? No, but Walter wants it to be true. So now all of a sudden, not only is it white America and, and the government and society and people that are holding Walter down and pointing out that he belongs to be lower, but now he's got a, a rich black man doing it to him as well. So now he sees it as him deferring his dreams or at least mocking him for it. And is it Walter's fault that he has no dreams? No. And by the way, where did uh, George get all his money? From his family. George didn't make it himself. He was lucky in that regard. And is that good? Yes, I'm happy for George. He's good, he, but he shouldn't act like he's better than them for it. Let's continue. Walter, plenty of time. Ruth, shocked at the lie. Walter Lee, younger. Walter, staring her down. Plenty. Pause. But we got a drink in this house. Why don't you offer this man something refreshment to George? They don't know how to entertain people in this house, man. George, thank you. I don't really care for anything. Walter, feeling his head. Sobriety coming. Where's mama? Ruth, she ain't come back yet. Walter, looking Murchison over from head to toe, scrutinizing his carefully casual tweed sports jacket over cashmere V-neck sweater, over soft eyelet shirt and tie, and soft slacks finished off with white buckskin shoes. Again, so he looks them up and down and he notices that he's wearing these very rich style clothes, white buckskin shoes, and again, Walter, 
he is right to say this man has just been not necessarily mocking Walter, but he was certainly acting better than Walter. Oh, I get to go to New York a couple times a year. Huh, huh, huh. You know, the, 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 the Broadway plays start at 840 and I get to go to them. So how does Walter deal with this? It's time in Walter's mind. He needs to knock him down a little bit. And this is what he says. Why all you college boys wear them faggoty looking white shoes? Ruth, Walter Lee, George Murchison ignores the remark. All right, time out. I want to point something out. Does Walter want to be a college boy too? And the answer is yes. Does Walter deserve to be a college boy? Of course. He's intelligent. He works hard. Why not? But here's the deal. He doesn't get that chance to go, right? His dreams are deferred. So why does he say that to him? Why are you college boys wear them faggoty looking white shoes? Why does he mock George like that? It's not, I mean, part of it is because he hates George because George gets his dreams and Walters are deferred. I think it's because he's jealous of George because George gets his dreams and Walters are deferred. Walter to Ruth. Well, they look crazy as hell. White shoes, cold as it is. Ruth crushed. You have to excuse him. Walter. No, he don't. Excuse me for what? What you always excusing me for? I'll excuse myself when I needs to be excused. A pause. They look as funny as them black knee socks Benita wears out of here all the time. Ruth, it's the college style, Walter. There it is again. Now he just mocked his sister for wearing her clothes the way they do in college again. It's because Walter wants to go to college. He's jealous of both of them. Walter, style hell. She looks like she got burnt legs or something. Oh, Walter. Walter, an irritable mimic. Oh, Walter. Oh, Walter. To Murchison. How's your old man making out? I understand you're all going to be buying that big hotel on the drive. Okay, so now here's Walter. He's changing the subject. And now he wants to talk business with George Murchison because he has heard, and it is true, that Walter's father is going to be buying a big hotel out, out in, the, in the city. And he wants to talk about him with him. He wants George to realize that Walter does have the intelligence and the drive and the charisma and the style to be a businessman as well. Why not? He's a human being. He's got all the abilities, but here's the deal. Watch, is George going to talk to Walter like an equal? I mean, would it be hard for George to talk to Walter like an equal? No, he could do it very simply. Make Walter feel better, right? But he's not going to do that because, again, George thinks he's better than Walter. Watch. How's your old man making that? I understand you're all going to be buying that big hotel on the drive. He finds a beer in the refrigerator, wanders over to Murchison, Murchison, sipping and wiping his lips with the back of his hand and straddling the chair backwards to talk to the other man. Shrewd move. Your old man is all right, man. Tapping his head and half winking for emphasis. I mean, he knows how to operate. I mean, he thinks big, you know what I mean? I mean, for a home, you know? But I think he's kind of running out of ideas now. I'd like to talk to him. Listen, man, I got some plans that could turn this city upside down. I mean, think I mean, think like he does. Big. Invest big. Gamble big. Hell, lose big if you have to. You know what I mean? It's hard to find a man on this whole South Side who understands my kind of thinking. You dig? So here comes Walter, and now he's got all these ideas about business, and he's got some good ideas. Some are bad, some are good, right? Some might work, some might not. And all he wants to do is talk to George about it. Like they're equals for a little while. Why can't George do that? All he said was, one day I'd like to talk to your father. And all George has to say is, cool, one day maybe we'll do that. Okay, listen. Uh, he scrutinizes Murchison again, drinks his beer, squints his eyes, and leans his clothes. Confidential, man to man. Me and you ought to sit down and talk sometimes, man. Man, I got me some ideas. George, with boredom. Yeah, sometimes we'll have to do that, Walter. Now, time out. All George had to say was, that's a good idea. Let's do that sometime. We'll go out, we'll have, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll sit and we'll chat it up. And I think G Walter would have felt better about the whole situation. At least somebody's allowing me to talk about my dreams. Somebody appreciates that I have these big ideas. But George says with boredom, yeah, sometimes we'll have to do that, Walter. Walter heard that in his voice. Walter knows that George is just dissing him and holding him down and also deferring his dreams. He doesn't want to talk to him about his dreams. So Walter, now he's angry, understanding the indifference and offended. Yeah, well, when you get the time, man, I know you're a busy little boy. Ruth, Walter, please. Walter, bitterly hurt. I know ain't nothing in this world as busy as you colored college boys with your fraternity pins and your white shoes. So now why again? Why does Walter turn to anger and bitterness? Why? Because he just gave this man a chance 
to talk to him man to man and have and to share their ideas. And George didn't do it. George doesn't want to talk to him man to man. George doesn't think that Walter has anything to offer him. And that's where George is dead wrong. George believes just like everybody else that because Walter is a black man and hasn't been educated, I didn't go to college and whatnot, that George has not that Walter has nothing to offer. And that is just not true. It's just not true. Of course, Walter has a lot to offer. He's got dreams. He's got ideas and plans. He, he can do just as much as everybody else if given the proper chances. And he's not given those chances. And now George isn't even given that chance. Why can't George give him the chance? How would it hurt him to do that? But he doesn't. And Walter knows it. So now everybody is deferring his dreams. And now Walter's going to lash out in anger. Remember our poem in the beginning. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it crust over like a sugary sweet? Does it, does it, does it, uh, does it, what was the other one? Does it, is it a heavy load or does it explode in anger? And that's where George, and that's where Walter is right now. He keeps having his dreams deferred by everybody and his family now. And now another black man as well is doing it to him. So if you're Walter, you're thinking to yourself, nobody's giving me a chance. I have no future, no chance in this life. So what am I even doing this for? Please remember the poem in the beginning. Does it crust over like a syrupy sweet? Oh, does it, does it, um, does it run like pus? Right? Remember that as well. And that's what's happening to George, I mean to, to Walter right now. That his dreams being deferred are killing him. They're, 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 they're crushing him. Let's see how he deals with this. This is where we're gonna stop today. Excellent job, as always, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure you answer all the questions. We have finished assignment number four, so make sure you have uh, answered all the questions for assignment number four and have a lovely day. We will pick up assignment number five tomorrow and we will see how much more negative things are going to affect Walter, that having his dreams deferred, how they're negatively going to, how they're going to negatively affect him and are they going to crush him at the end? Is he going to explode? Or is the family going to be able to help him stay together? As a family, can they stay together? Just like mama keeps that plant together and alive, can they help keep Walter together and sane? We'll find out as we move on. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you very much.